All right, since, uh, hey there folks, it seems like I was just here. Since book tour and conventions are still on somewhat of a staggered return, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster season seven, intriguing interviews with creative minds. As I'm sure you can tell by our Saturday broadcast that we're doing something a little different today. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, for about the last 10 years, I've been part of an author collective known as Crazy 8 Press. And as the name suggests, we are indeed a little bit crazy. And we also love superheroes. And if you do too, then you've come to the right place as we bring you a special event, Phenomenons Con Part Two. Uh, as many of you may know, we launched the Phenomenons, uh, a superhero themed collection through a successful Kickstarter campaign. And as a special thank you to our backers and to those who might wanna buy uh, the print book after it launches, we wanted to host this live event, uh, giving you an inside look into the world of the Phenomenons and what some of our author contributors had in mind as we dive into this new universe. On our panel this afternoon is one half of Crazy 8 Press, including authors, Bob Greenberger, Good evening. All right, we got Glenn Hallman. Hi, folks. All right, we got Peter Hello. Damon. We got, we got Peter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. It's kind of hard to hear you since I'm in a, in a convention center. All right, we got, we got Aaron Rosenberg. Hi, right, guys. How's it going? All right, you got yours truly. And last not but not least, the mastermind behind all of today's madness, Michael Jan Friedman. Hello, 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 oh boy. hello, All right. hello. Grandpa's got to turn down that hearing aid just a little bit. All right, uh, so just a heads up to the folks at home. Since we have the Crazy 8 gang here today, we're going to break the mold um, and do some live bannering through the chat box. So feel free to have at it throughout the show, and the gang will chat with you as we do the live interviews. And of course, please send any comments or questions you have for me uh, or any of the other authors, and we'll get to them both during the show and at the end. All right, so we're gonna jump in. Uh, Mike, The Phenomenons is your baby. Uh, talk to me about the genesis of this project. You know, what drive you to create this new universe and then give everybody a setup um, for your character and maybe the kinds of stories we might see in the pages of this new collection. And uh, just give me one second, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you guys uh, what The Phenomenons is all about. All right, so Mike, why don't you uh, take it away? Sure, sure. Well, you know, I've always loved comics and, uh, and superhero awesome. comics in particular. And at the age of uh, five or six, when they, when comics kind of invented their magic, they were, um, uh, as Fitzgerald says, uh, I'm going to give you a literary reference here in, uh, in The Great Gatsby, they were an object commensurate with my capacity for wonder. Um, it was all the wonder I could stuff into my five or six year old head. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, I actually wrote comics for a while. And more recently, um, I edited a series of anthologies, shared world anthologies uh, called a Pangea for, for Crazy Eight. And as a result of that experience, I started thinking of what else we could do in the way of a shared world project. And the thing that kept, kept knocking on my skull was superheroes. Uh, and of course, there was a, a model for that already, uh, the Wild Cards people, George R.R. R. Martin and uh, Melinda Snodgrass had already done that, oh, maybe 20 times. Um, so there was, uh, there was a model for it. We knew it could work, um, uh, but we wanted to do a different set of circumstances. So in, in our superhero universe, the financial crisis of 2008 uh, never gets resolved. We never crawl out of that. And it sets the stage for the rise of a class of, um, we'll call them American oligarchs, uh, the captains of industry. Um, and these, these are rich guys who do everything they can to stay rich guys. And they, um, and, uh, you know, they, they tread on the, on the common man who's, who's helpless. Um, the first hero who responds to this set of circumstances is called Grey Guardsman. He's, he has no superpowers, but he's, uh, he's bright and dedicated and he's a physical specimen and he fights with all, everything at his disposal against these oligarchs. Um, much to his surprise, 
his his example gives rise to a host of other heroes, um, uh, some of them superpowered, and some of them like him uh, without superpowers. Um, a whole generation of superheroes. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I could I could, you know, uh, assign heroes to to uh, the various writers who who I was recruiting for this. And then I said, no, that's they have to come up with their own ideas. That's where they're going to do the best job. Um, if they can, if they can uh, come up with original characters that they can get invested in. Um, now, some of them, some of these heroes uh, uh, are are doing familiar things, like uh, uh, Paul Kupperberg's hero, um, Torque, is a super speedster. And you know, you may say, well, we've seen super speedsters before. But if you read Paul's story in, in this volume, this first volume of, of Phenomenons, you'll see his, his super speedster is like no other that you've seen before. Uh, the other super speedsters are pretty much racing toward the future. And his is, is running away. And you'll see why when you read the story. Um, in other cases, uh, our characters are completely original. Uh, we have we have uh, uh, Marie V. Bear's character is uh, is uh, called Lipstick Lily, and she fights crime with an array of specialty lipsticks. So I dare you to find me find me another hero who fights crime with specialty lipsticks. So it's really um, uh, uh, an array of of very uh, well thought out and exciting characters. Um, I'll say uh, uh, some of our other non uh, Crazy Eight colleagues who I should mention in addition to Marie, uh, uh, Keith DeCandido has a uh, hero called Luminosity. Um, uh, Ilse J. Bick has a, has a cadre of, of intelligent animals uh, who, who are also a, a, a different not something uh, on the on the beaten superhero track, and uh, Michael Burstein has a a character called Red Sky, uh, who who you'll see is is a little different from any other uh, superhero you've seen before. So so it it's been very exciting for me to uh, to get the first look at all these characters and uh, and their stories, but uh, we've. Uh, we've got uh, the first volume is available in ebook form, and soon it'll be uh, by July. It'll be available as a as a uh, trade paperback uh, to everyone. And uh, in a couple of weeks, around May seventh, we'll be uh, kickstarting volume two. Uh, and uh, volume two will have, uh, in addition to the usual uh, cast of writers, we'll also have Alex Segura. Who's, uh, who's making uh, waves with, uh, with his new book, Secret Identity. So we're, uh, we're, we're bolstering our ranks with, uh, with even more talent. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next step. Russ? There we go. That's uh, great stuff, Mike, thank you. Um, now we're gonna dive into the rest of volume one. Um, so Glenn, oh no, uh, so we got a three-part story, uh, not necessarily a three-part story per se, but we have three stories uh, where their characters sort of overlap a bit. Um, so Bob, why don't you kind of talk to us about your character and your story and why you went in a particular direction, but again, you know, no, no spoilers for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Um, if we were gonna have a superhero universe, just about every superhero universe has some government agency best known uh, to Marvel fans as S.H.I.E.L.D. and all. So I figured uh, this universe needed something similar to that, but based on the parameters uh, that Mike created for this, this really was gonna be a government agency. It wasn't gonna be this, you know, connected to some something quasi-governmental or secretive and all. This is a legitimate agency. It's part of Homeland Security called the Cyber Engagement Division. And uh, a lot of the inspiration for this came from a relatively obscure TV series uh, from 1972 called Search. 
that ran on NBC. And there they had their agents implanted with cybernetics. So they were cutting edge for 1972, but basically they had um, embedded into their skulls uh, transceivers so that they can communicate with um, their central control and they carried devices that allowed them to um, have cameras that would, had infrared and other um, you know, lenses that allowed them to see and do things. And I figured by updating this to the time period that Mike set, setting the universe in, um, the technology has come much, much, much further. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do over the course of the stories is how, at what point does machinery overtake the humanity? Uh, but along the way, we've got our director, we've got our agents, some are field agents that are uh, veterans pulled from other agencies, others are trainees. So in my story, I've got the veteran taking a trainee out on the first, um, not an iPhone, Aaron, stop that, um, um, out on her first field mission. So it's, they're getting to, he's testing to see what she knows in the field, and they're going to investigate um a supplier that apparently might be double dealing and using the tech being built for the government to be sold to nefarious sources and while there encounters Aaron's character and uh, and both of our characters benefit from this mysterious entity that Glenn created so while the stories all stand alone they do intersect make sense All right, very good. <clears throat> so, uh, so Bob, uh, you're you wind up overlapping also with. So, Glenn, why don't you talk to us about uh, so your your character, you know, why you wanted to go in that direction, and just kind of give us a sense of the kind of story that that you uh, that you contributed. My character is a character known as Null. Um, Null is a kind of I'm sorry, Russ, just to interrupt for a second. Is the camera actually switching to me? I can't tell. Yes. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, Null is a character. He doesn't really have a name. He goes, he's in fact made serious efforts to wipe out any trace of his existence, any trace of who he was, and to move in the world as a ghost in the machine, for want of a better term. Um, he would be, he is, there's an argument as to whether he is one of the greatest computer hackers ever, or just really well knowledgeable, or whether he has other abilities, but he's, his primary goal, no matter what he does, is to stay as anonymous as humanly possible. Why he's staying anonymous is because he's afraid that something is hunting him. Something is looking for him. And the only way to fight it is anonymously. Um, how he finds some of the things and some of the weirdness that goes on in the world. Occasionally, he finds that some people are building strange technologies or that they are going further in places where he hadn't expected technology to be improving. Uh, for what ends, he can't entire, he's been doing a very good job figuring out and he can understand where most of it's coming from, but he's not getting all of it. He's getting pieces that don't quite make sense. So he tries to keep a tab on them. And in the course of doing all of that stuff, he comes across Aaron's character who, makes absolutely no sense to him whatsoever. This Aaron's character, by everything Null knows, should not exist, should not have the capabilities that she has. There's no possible way. So he's going to be a little bit obsessed with her right now. But at this point, I should hand it over to Aaron, who should explain who his character is that's right so aaron so you're uh you're you're, you're the, th the third leg of this tripod so uh what uh <laughs> what tell us about your character 
uh, you know, why you wanted to kind of go and that with that kind of character and the, the type of story that, uh, that you went in. And then when, after you've done that, um, if the three of you guys can talk a little bit about your process, about, you know, how you uh, collaborated so that your stories were not sort of, um, you know, bumping up, contradicting each other, um, but yet remaining kind of separate stories. Yeah, so um, <laughs> careful, Mike. That will definitely make it illegal in Florida. Um, you know, when, when Mike started talking to us about what we wanted to do with this and the whole Notion Pine phenomenons, um, you know, as a lot of people know, I, I like to turn things on their ear a little bit and not necessarily provide the story people are expecting me to provide. So, you know, when he was talking about superheroes, I really wanted to do somebody who wasn't necessarily a superhero, somebody who was really just sort of falling into this situation, trying to do what was right, but not with any intention of I'm going to put on a cape, I'm going to put on a, you know, a mask, and I'm going to go out and save people. Um, I also really like the idea of playing with somebody who didn't know her own capabilities. So, you know, the, the great thing about uh, my character, Black Hat, is that if, if Glenn's character is mystified by what she can do, she's just as mystified. She is literally feeling her way through this uh, one bit at a time and working out things as she goes, you know, so Mike and I talked about it and he, he liked the idea, fortunately. And, uh, you know, it was, it was fun to explore. Um, you're definitely seeing the genesis of a character. You're seeing, in fact, this story is how she gets her name. Um, and it's really, you know, she starts out motivated by something very personal um, and honestly, almost selfish. And, you know, she is on that path though to become something bigger and better than what she thinks she can do. Very cool. Um, if we let her get to that point. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so this is, so Aaron, uh, Bob, um, Glenn, so the three of you in different ways sort of, you know, cross paths in each other's stories. So what was, what was the process there so that, you know, again, you guys were writing standalones, but allowing um, your characters to sort of enter into each other's stories. How, how did so, that work? You know, it was actually really, really easy and really fluid because, you know, Mike was sort of encouraging people to have crossovers and, you know, mention each other's characters and things like that, if possible, because that's how you build that sense of a cohesive world rather than individual it's stories just boring. floating in space. Um, so, you know, know when we were talking about it, we were talking about the meeting uh, we were talking at the meeting and, uh, <clears throat> you know, Bob and I pretty much immediately sort of turned to each other and we're like, wait a second, you're doing a character with some sort of cyber elements. You're doing a, an agency with cyber elements. These guys could definitely run up against each other, but, you know, Bob's doing a government agency and I'm doing a complete and utter novice freelancer. They're going to be approaching things from exact opposite ends, from totally different perspectives, totally different backgrounds and skills. And then Glenn sort of chimed in, was like, wait a second, I'm doing something that involves like cyber and hacking and things. So, you know, my character is definitely a behind the scenes sort of figure and could be behind the scenes in what both of you are doing. And so the three of us got to talking and sort of, you know, figuring it out. And it just worked out really nicely that my character's goal and Bob's character's mission and Glenn's character's interest all wound up overlapping perfectly without being the same story. They, they occur and, in the same spot. Right. And then uh, we had several phone calls together, followed by emails back and forth. And then we shared drafts with each other. Um, invariably, Aaron and I would keep complaining about what Glenn did or didn't do or made us wait. Um, and then, you know, Mike said, looks good to me. And the next thing you know, it's in print. I will note that my I, one other one other thing as far as the timing goes, most of most of the initial work was done by Aaron and Bob. Part of it because at least my character one, the two of them could work together very directly, and my character and the stuff that I had was going to be going on behind the scenes, and to a certain extent, neither one of their neither one of their teams were necessarily informed about what I was doing, so it was easier for me to to come in afterwards after I saw what those two people, what they had done and add in backfill and say, okay, here's this, here's why I think this happened here. Here's why this character has dropped, you know, this character has dropped the dime to 
Bob's agency, for example, about the double dealers. Um, and for whatever reason, he hasn't decided to go after him himself or anything else. He just says, you know what, let the, let the agency do this. I want to see what they're up to. I want to, you know, I want to test what they're, you know, how they're going to respond to this. Um, and then in the course of this, he saw, you know, Aaron, we saw Aaron's character come along and went, wait a minute, what is this person doing? Wait a minute, how is this person? What, huh? What? Huh? And it, it goes on from there. So... All right, so we got three. So we've got three individual stories, all kind of in the same loose genre, but they're individual, and your characters sort of um, impede on each other's stories a, a, a little bit, um, while yet going sort of uh, in your own individual directions. All right, very cool. All right, so next, so Peter, um, what do you got for us? Well, like I said, I'm sitting here at a San Diego Comic Fest, which is no relation to the comic convention. So I may be interrupted by people who want me to autograph things. Um, so I apologize for that. So what? What? But what? What? What's? Your, who's your character, and what's the kind of the general idea of your story? My character is Professor Paracelsus. I wanted to base him on something that really theoretically exists in the real world. And I decided to go with the Philosopher's Stone, which actually severely predates the Harry Potter books, which is what a lot of people know it from. But there was actually a guy named, named Paracelsus who is obsessed with finding the actual Philosopher's Stone, which is capable of transmuting elements. And I thought, if anything, would be appealing to a superhero or perhaps a supervillain. Having control over the elements would definitely be that thing. And what, um, so what, what's the, um, you know, without giving away the spoilers, what sort of, what are you trying to get across in the story itself? I'm trying to get across the concept of this guy who is a superhero, but isn't especially comfortable with the entire concept. And he's actually just trying to live as much of an ordinary life as he possibly can. And he has a daughter who winds up pulling him into a situation that he doesn't really want to become a part of in the least. So he's but a, he winds up being pulled into it in order to save her life. So he's a reluctant, a reluctant hero. Exactly so. Right. All right. Very cool. Okay. All right, folks. So uh, before we move on uh, to the next section, I want to uh, bring up a, a very special guest that we have today join, joining us in our, in our project. Um, he's known, you may, known, you may know him from Pokemon, Pokemon Detective Pikachu, Adam's Family 2, The Tick, One Day at a Time, and the upcoming shows Ultraviolet and Blue Demon, as well as Koala Man. So please welcome uh, our pal writer and producer, Dan Hernandez. Dan, welcome. Hey, to hi everybody. Dan, welcome to the asylum. Uh, Dan has contributed a story for volume one and has a story planned for volume two. So what can you tell us uh, about your character and uh, give us a sense of the story that you've written for volume one. Again, no spoilers. No and, spoilers. And if you can, just even a hint of what maybe is coming for volume two. Well, my characters are named Colossa y Particula, which are the Colossus and the, the particle, basically in Spanish. Um, they are sisters and they sort of have powers equivalent to uh, Ant-Man and Giant-Man, respectively. Uh, uh, the particle gets very small, uh, Colossus obviously gets very big, Colossa. And uh, my story is about what happens when the growth goes out of control and is there a maximum point where the human frame can, can, uh, can no longer endure something like, you know, a giant, giant growth and what two sisters who are sort of not on the best of terms, will do to to protect each other, um, and how to, you know, how to reconcile their differences, both in temperament and in power and in all kinds of different things, all set against the backdrop of this great shared universe, uh, you know, and New York and 
and all of these awesome things. And I, and I think that for the second volume, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's some questions around why one of the sisters sort of uh, hung up her gear and went in a certain direction. And the, que the answer to that question is addressed in the first story. And I'm hoping to continue to explore uh, the mythology of, of these characters and hopefully beginning to fold in also some of these other great characters that my, this illustrious group have created and, and are, are just so great in the, in the anthology. Oh, very, very cool. So you've got uh, diametrically opposed powers and they're probably in conflict with one each other, with each other for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which, just that they're related. Um, what was sort of the impetus to sort of kind of go in that direction? Well, I wanted to do something that was, I wanted, you know, I felt like my family had come to, New, to the Bronx in the forties from Cuba. And I wanted to, and I lived in New York for four years and I wanted to do something that felt like authentic to my family's history. You know, the, the main characters' names are, are Norris and Ophelia, who are actually my, the names of my grandmother and, and one of her sisters. Uh, and I felt like this community was part of the fabric of New York, but at the same time, I didn't want it to be just about, look at these, you know, Latina superheroes, look at this culture. I felt like in a more, at least for me, I think that my cultural background is one of among many fab, you know, sort of interweaving threads of kind of my history and my family's history. And so I wanted it to be a very New York story with a very New York family that felt culturally specific, but also very American and very like the New York that I experienced when I lived there and, and that felt vibrant. And I think that one of the things I'm really, I thought was so cool about the anthology is there are heroes with all different kinds of backgrounds that felt, it feels like New York in, a, in the right way, in a good way. Um, and that was something pretty exciting when I was reading through each story to see everybody's different take on that and what that could mean. And, and some of the stories are not in New York, but a lot of them are. And I, I thought that was really cool. So that was the, the, the sort of the textural, you know, culturally textural background. But then I started to think about, well, what are some heroes? I, I kind of wanted to address and archetype, archetypical heroes. And I really, you know, I, I make my marvel. That's where I started. That's where I, <laughs> you know, reading people like Peter David growing up, uh, Peter may not remember this, I actually came up and introduced myself to you at a Comic-Con in San Diego many years ago, just said you were a huge influence. So to, to have my story be a lot, Ron Mars also contributed to the to the thing, you know, my. Mike Freeman is someone I read growing up. All, really everyone on this in this book, I've read your work growing up and it was a huge influence. And so for that reason, I felt like I wanted to kind of go back to the root of Marvel comics anyway, and sort of start exploring that giant man, Ant-Man, Avengers type powers, but to try to treat it in a way that was literary, I guess. And in a way that was, um, taking it pretty, you know, kind of, what did it really mean to, to be able to grow as, so, as tall as a building? What, how, how would that affect you? And how would that in turn affect your personality? Would you have an outsized personality? And if you were able to be small all the time, would you start to perceive yourself as small, especially in relationship to someone who is huge and present all the time and very glamorous and, and sort of who can't help but be seen. And so that was the start of the that's sort of the, gen yeah, the genesis of the story. Uh, very well. It's really cool, and we're 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 thrilled that you uh, that you're able to join us. Um, okay, now that was great, but now it's time for a special seg segment of the show where we spin the wheel. On the wheel are seven possible categories, some of which I created just for this panel. Wherever it lands is what you get, and the categories are: I Cyborg, Quantum Leap, Stranger in a Strange Land, Super Real, Super Special, Mirror Mirror, and Kick Him in the Junk. And because Glenn has to roll out, Glenn, you're up first. You ready? Ah. All right, here we go. Round and round. <laughs> I was hoping. Where, where's the delete button? Give me that. That's it. Come on, no whammies. Here we go. And oh the big guy gets. Oh, what better? Kick him in the junk. Okay, so one of our more popular categories. All right, you can travel to any point in time and space, 
and without repercussion, you can kick someone in the junk, who would it be? Oh, mm. there are, there are, no, Keith, you, it's not me. I get to kick somebody else in the, and in fact, just for Keith actually bringing that up in the first place, I think I'm going to start with Keith the candidate. <laughs> <laughs> just, just because I'm seeing, I'm looking in the chat room and I'm seeing, oh, look, hey, everybody's going at this. Yeah, okay. Keith first, Bob second at this point. I'm getting that. <laughs> All right. You know, bad enough that both of you kill me. Now it's sitting there going, this is insult. This is insult to, to homicide. I mean, come on, guys. Not <laughs> uh, All right, Keith. Um, where, where, okay. your, where your cup? <laughs> All right. So who's, all right, Peter, you're up next. You ready? All right, Peter's got I Cyborg. Okay, so I, this is our one of our newer categories. If the technology were available today, and aside from the cosmetic component, there are no health concerns, would you want to be fused with a cranial implant that that gives you direct interface with modern technology? I feel like I already am. I'm talking on an iPad. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thousands of miles away from all of you. I have a telephone that I can use to talk to you. I can see you. I mean, I feel like we are living in the world of the future that Epcot Center was predicting. You know, it, it talked about doing this exact kind of thing. So I feel that I'm already doing that, um, you know. I don't think I would really need to advance myself in any way, shape, or form. I do know who I'd kick in the nuts, though. <laughs> well, 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 we'll have to spin that on the next one. All right. So, Bob, you're up next. All right, Bob, and for you, we got... I'm mesmerized. All right. Oh, no, no duplicates. So, we did that one already. Oh, here we go. Quantum Leap. There we go. So you volunteered to step into the quantum leap accelerator. Only you get to pick where you go and when within your own lifetime. What's your destination? Wow. Okay. My lifetime. Um, I'm old. Let me think. There are a lot of years to cover here. Um, my lifetime. Wow. I don't know. Might be cool to be at Mission Control in 1969 in Houston. All right, right on. Be uh, be at the heart, be at the heart of the space launch. So sounds yeah. good. All right, all right, Dan, you ready? I guess so. Yes. All right. What do we got? Come on, no whammies. All right, big Dan. What do we got for you? We got no nope, one more. No duplicates. All right, Stranger in a Strange Land. Okay, so um, what's one genre you'd like to write in that you have not dabbled in yet? Hmm, um, that's an interesting question. I've been fortunate to do a lot of the things I'm interested in. Um, I guess historical fiction would be one that I would really enjoy writing. I, I think I, I read a lot of nonfiction histories. I, I listen to a lot of nonfiction podcasts and I, I think that that's an area that I would really like to treat at some point in the future. I just haven't gotten to do it yet. So I think that historical fiction for sure. All right, fair enough. All right, Big Mike, you ready? For what? You're up next. <laughs> All right, Mike, what do we got for you? All right, Mirror Mirror, one of our newer categories on the show. All right, so a rift has occurred in the metaverse. You have the opportunity for a face-to-face -face meeting with an alternate version of yourself. You won't have any idea how similar or different you and your two worlds are from each other until, you, or, until or unless you meet. And there are no guarantees that you'll like what you see or hear. Um, nor do you have any idea how it might impact you going forward. Do you take that meeting with your other self? I have to tell you, I think my wife and I would give you different answers. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would say one is more than enough. I don't think she could handle more than one, but I would like, sure, I'd like to see 
mm, the other me from from another reality. I'd like to like to see, you know, maybe maybe in another reality I still have hair. That would that would be interesting. Well, that uh, would that would definitely have to be another reality, then. So. Yeah, you're not kidding. It wouldn't be. <laughs> so, uh, but I yeah no I. I, I would take that chance. I would take that chance and I would, I would, uh, I would meet the other me's, me or me's. Me's. All right. Fair enough. All right, Aaron, ready? What do we got for you? Ready, Freddy. I want to talk Bob have to say for himself. All right. What do we got? And you got, no, nope, you go super special. All right. This is one of our, this is a, the newest category we have so far. Okay. Oh, here we go. Though they mostly originated in comic books and pulp fiction, superheroes have also appeared in animated shows, live action TV and movies. There are many to choose from, but what is your, who is your favorite superhero of all time? Favorite of all time. I got to go with Spidey. I mean, that's pretty much who I started reading. You know, I'm still a massive Spider-Man fan. Um, you know, I've seen all the movies obviously, but you know, really it was the comic books. It was seeing somebody who was, not the biggest, the best, the strongest, the, the most handsome, you know, a normal kid who would, then was gifted with these powers and trying to just deal with them as best he could. I mean, that, you know, Marvel had a way of resonating with, with people by having characters that were like us and Peter Parker far and away the most like me, so. All right, very cool. All right, so I usually don't do this on the show, but since I am a part of Crazy A Press, I'm gonna take a spin at the wheel. So here we go for me. All right, what go we... for it. All right, let's see. There's not too many left, so I get. I, I get... think I see that that wheel every day on my computer. All right, so I got. No, we did that one. We did that one. We did that one. Super real. All right, what is this one? I don't even remember. Okay, in today's world, as it actually is, if you could choose for there to be real life superheroes with enhanced abilities and all that comes with it, including super villains, would you be okay with the world populated with superheroes? Huh. And the answer is, you know, I think I would. Um, the world has gone so freaking batshit as it is. Um, you know, it may just come to the point where it's time to just mix it up at the next level. I mean, for all we know, we're going to be having them anyway. I mean, we're writing about it. We might as well do it for real. All right. So that's what we got there. So now we've got another, uh, another uh, section of the show. We've got four options, A, B, C, and D, where you pick your poison. Bob, you're up first. A, B, C, or D? L. Great. C. C. All right. C is... All right, now we're going we're gonna to find out if you have thick skin. As writers, when we put our work and ourselves out there, criticism of all kinds comes with it. The good, the bad, and everything in between. How do you honestly feel about reviews? Honestly, um, I don't read all of the reviews I get at Amazon or Goodreads or elsewhere. I, I get the gist of them, but, you know, scanning, and I look at the ones that seem to have something to say as opposed to I'm giving it one star because I didn't like that it arrived bent in my box or something. Um, I'm okay with it. There, there are times I think, you know, they get picky in and there are times I think I've done better than they give me credit for. And other times I think they're dead honest and they caught me on, on you know, it was an off book. So I'm, a, I'm fine with them. All right. All right, Aaron, you're up next. We've got uh, A, B or D. I got to go with A, obviously. Hey, duh. All right. Oh, wow. All right. You're, you're, we're going to, we're going to give you some, we're going to give you some truth serum. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, of course, I've got to find where I put the gut. Where, where I put, put the, the truth serum. Right? Yes, of course. So hang on. So of course, I actually hid the truth serum in another section of our world. So bear with me just one minute and we'll get it. I, um, I, uh, I was, a, I, was a, I was a naughty boy and I didn't uh, come prepared. So give me one second and we're going to do this one. And you didn't want everybody else getting hold of the truth serum, obviously. That's so. exactly right. No, this is, a good, this, is a, this is a good one. So hang on. Prove hang it. On. <laughs> All right, hang on. Where is it? I'm sorry about this. I spent so much time preparing and I forgot. Live television, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. All right. So just, just give me a second. So here's what we're going to do. While I'm searching for this, Aaron, that one's yours. I'm going to skip to another one. We're you're, you're next. Dan, 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 you got you got B 
or D? Uh, well, I guess I'll go D for, for Dan. D for Dan. And then we're coming back to Aaron. Okay. Okay. Uh, advice column. So uh, we're both in the writing business to different degrees. Um, what's the best and worst writing advice you ever got? Mm -hmm. um, I think the best writing advice that I've ever received is th there's sort of two parts of the same question, which is, I think that anytime anyone has advised me to try to ch chase a trend or try to capture something that's already happening, that's always a mistake and never the right thing to do. I think that, you know, sometimes, especially when you're writing screenplays and, and movies, you know, because, because I don't have as much, you know, fiction stuff as, as these illustrious gents, but, um, but in TV and movies, you know, there's sometimes there's a trend. It's like, well, you know, vampires are hot. You gotta, you gotta write a vampire spec. And that's always a mistake. And I think the, t the times that I've been encouraged to write something that is more personal to me or something that is extremely weird that it seems like only I could ever enjoy, those are the, the scripts that inevitably have served me the best because every now and then you run into someone who says, you know, maybe that script is wrong for 99% of people, but you find that one person who just gets it completely. And that, that often leads to really nice, that's how I ended up working on The Tick uh, with Ben Edlund who created The Tick, which is, you know, we sent out a script that really wasn't that well received, my writing partner and I, uh, and he just got it. He just got it immediately. So it was the right thing for the right person. And I, so I think that really, following your instinct about what turns you on is always the right thing. And trying to chase something is, you're always gonna get left in the dust on that. And that's, that's, that's I think, the best advice I've ever seen. All right, very cool. All right, Aaron, so we're back. So we're gonna give you some truth serum, okay? I'm gonna ask you 10 questions. Answer quickly, you ready? All right. All right, favorite flavor ice cream? Chocolate. Pi pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Sure. Bucket list destination anywhere in the world? Japan. Uh, scariest movie you ever saw? Candyman. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Teleportation. Uh, do you play any musical instruments? I used to play guitar a long time ago. Okay. All right. Uh, if you could be good at one, good at one instrument, what would it be? <laughs> Probably pick the guitar back up. <laughs> there you go. You can only have one: wealth or friendship. Friendship. Cats or dogs? Mm. Cats, I guess. You can see a live performance, sports, music, theater, whatever, any seat, any venue. What's your choice? Ooh, um, any time, Beatles. Where? Um, I don't even remember where they played necessarily. So uh, Wrigley, I think they played Wrigley. Hey Stadium, baby. There you go. All right, most impactful, where were you then moment? Um, Where was I? Um, when the Challenger exploded, probably. Ooh, yes, that was a that was a gruesome one. Okay, all right. So we got a few more. I'm reordering. I'm reordering these so we can get a, so we, can get a <laughs> we can get a fresh sample. So there's no so there's no cheating here. Okay, we got this. I got A, B, C, and D. Okay, Peter, A, B, C, or D. Okay, what was the question? A, B, C, or D? Pick one. D for David. D for, D. okay. Okay, again, oh no, wait, that's, which one is you? This is, oh, whoops, you wanted D. Okay, again, so that again, thick skin. How do you honestly feel about reviews? How do I honestly feel about what? Reviews. If they're intelligent, I'm fine with it. If they're idiotic, they annoy the living crap out of me. Sometimes they show a lack of intelligence on the part of the reviewer. Um, I wrote a book called Artful, and I was a sequel to Oliver Twist. And I wrote it very much in the style of Charles Dickens. And review, people reviewed it and clearly had not read anything by Dickens. And they said, I don't understand why he says things like, dear reader, 
you know, and all the affectations I picked up from Dickens, the people who didn't like the book didn't understand. So all they did was display their own lack of intelligence. And that annoyed the living crap out of me. All right, fair enough. All right, Mike. Yes. Okay, we got A, B, or C. I'll take A for Mike. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I'm going to sound like a jerk. But I work here every year. I think all right, they, Mike, we're going back. With this hand, so they're all uniform. I'm sorry. I guess a good place would be uh, Mike, in the uh, air or in that corner. Peter, mute yourself. There we go. Uh, all right. So going back to our, our advice column, what's the best and worst advice you ever got? Writing you know, advice. It's, you know, it's funny. In, in the last in the last segment, uh, they asked uh, you asked Alex Segura this, and he said exactly exactly what I would have said. The best advice is finish what you start. You can't you can't even know what kind of beginning you've got until you write the end. So, you know, they have to work together and, and finish what you start, I think, is, is, the, is the best advice. And the worst advice, which Alex also said, is, um, is write what you know. You know, if I, if I only wrote what I know, I would never have written anything. Uh, I've written 30 plus Star Trek books. Believe me, I haven't been in space. I know I look like I, ha I haven't been in space. So, so uh, I think that's a, that's, that works sometimes for some people, but I think that's, that's very overused. So that's, that's the best advice and the worst advice. All right, fair enough. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna take a stab. I'm not even gonna look. I'm gonna do this randomly. Whatever I get, I get. And I got, okay, all, okay. Here's, here's one of our newest categories on the show. Even though I'm asking myself, I'm going to give you the, the wind up for what this uh, what this category is. And it is all or nothing or steady as she goes. So for those of you who haven't heard this one before. Um, so I have two options that are going to define the rest of my career. I can only pick one. And my choices are my next book is an international bestseller where I win every award there is. I make tons of money. The, the book gets made into a movie that wins the Academy Award for Best Picture. I can ride the success forever. I'll always be that writer. However, every book I write after that, and every single one, is an absolute dumpster fire, critically trashed, and a commercial zero. I'm called a washed up hack who can no longer even string together two cohesive sentences. Or I keep writing as I've been doing, um, generally well respected, and however much money I've made up to this point is pretty much how I'm going to go. Um, so the question for me is, which career path do I pick? Uh, all or nothing or steady as she goes. And I actually got this one on the last panel. Um, so I don't know how I ended up with it again. But the answer is, if the brass rings in front of me, I'm grabbing it. And, uh, and, if, and, if, and if I'm called the washed up hack after that, I will, uh, I'll find a way to sleep on my bed made out of money. So <laughs> I'll find a way to soothe myself. Okay, so uh, we're going to take any questions from the audience with the few minutes that we have left. Uh, Aaron, we got anything in the chat box or are we caught up? No, we're all good. We're all good. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to share my screen one more time and, uh, and then we're going to call it a day. So just bear with me for just a minute. And we are here. Okay. So, um, so Mike, we've talked about the phenomenon. So just so I'm clear. The ebook itself is out now, is available. The print book will be available uh, in July, ready for shore leave, correct? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right. So the you can get the ebook now, and uh, we we will be advertising uh, the book, the, the the trade paperback in July after I get the suckers signed for our backers. Uh, so yeah, that's true. And, and you notice the, the uh, right, good. I'm glad you brought that up. So this is the, the uh, not the finished product, but this is the, the first uh, uh, run at the cover for the second volume, which is called uh, Phenomenon Season of Darkness, talking about Dickens, right? And um, uh, the, we, you see on the cover here, you have Syntax, which is Russ's character. Uh, on the, yeah, right there. And then uh, on the other side in the trench coat is Penny Trouble, that's Hildy's character. Um, 
to, next to Hildy, we see Luminosity, Keith. There is Luminosity. And it not finished. She has uh, some elements that still have to be added. And next to her is uh, Marie V. Bear's uh, character, Lipstick Lily, with all those lipsticks. And then kind of flying into the picture is a, is a character called Better Angel, who, who's absolutely my favorite name for a superhero. Um, I can't believe nobody used that before. And uh, she's sort of a, sort of a, a super girl type, type character. Um, and so this is the, the first rudimentary draft, uh, if you will, of the, uh, of the cover for the second volume. And, and you know, I, I, I told the artist, I said, I want, I want to make it an all girl cover. I don't know why. It just felt like volume two should be an all girl cover. And, and there it is. Um, and so we'll we'll work on this a little more, and uh, uh, in a couple of weeks when we uh, launch the Kickstarter for this volume, uh, you'll you'll see the uh, more slightly more refined product. All right, great. So Bob, what do we got? You're muted, Bob. Bob, you're muted. Sorry about that. I don't know when I'm muted. Um, this is Above the Ground. It is a novel coming out in October. I co-wrote it with the uh, CEO of Heavy Metal Magazine, Matt Medney, who's uh, uh, about to get married in New Orleans right about now. Anyway, um, it is this wild story in, uh, set 100 years in the future where we discover that the ancient Mayans really went underground and circumstances on the surface have... Um, decided that maybe it's time for them to get more actively involved in, in global events. And it's got, let's see, quantum physics, time travel, ancient Mayans, uh, a breakaway section of the United States forming its own nation. So you got some civil war, nuclear warfare, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and I've been uh, spending the weekend researching for book two, which I will be writing over the summer after I write my story for uh, Phenomenon's two electric boogaloo. All right, so above the ground is it? When is it out? October. All right, great. All right. Uh, whoa, whoa. What do we got here? Hold on. I don't know why this image is coming up so big, but such is life. Chuck Bob takes over the world. Yes, he does. Good God, big image. <laughs> I don't know. Can't make it smaller. So what do we got? You know, I just went with the, the classic, uh, in part because if not for No Small Bills, which is the first Duck Bob novel, of course, uh, Russ and I never would have met. That's so, right. Wow, you're right. That is true. Right? Um, because, of course, Russ and I met uh, at, a, at a PhilCon That's years right. ago. Yes. Wow. And That's Russ right. was in the dealer's room selling Finders Keepers. That's right. And uh, I stopped by and I was curious about it and asked him about it. And he's like, oh, it's a science fiction comedy. I know nobody does that. And I said... I do that. <laughs> I have a science fiction comedy out too. And then we started talking and it turned out we were both from New York and uh, yeah, you know, friendship was born. So plus, you know, No Small Bills was my, my first um, Crazy Eight book, uh, second one that we put out just in total. Um, and it's also, you know, the only, the only book I've ever completely pantsed. I didn't have a plan going into it other than just to write something very fun and very silly. Uh, you know, spawned three sequels and a whole bunch of short stories afterwards still one of my favorite characters ever to write. So yeah, kind of had to go with it. All right, very cool. All right, uh, so hold on, I'm gonna do this real quick just for Glenn because he couldn't make it. So we put out uh, an anthology some years ago to keep killing Glenn because let's face it, if anyone needs to be killed repeatedly, it's Glenn Hellman and we all took our, we all took our shots at him and boy, did we have a good time doing it. All right, Dan, what do we got? Well, I just put up uh, Pokemon Detective Pikachu. It's a movie that I wrote along with my partner, Benji. Uh, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of the way that it turned out. I, I'm, it was awesome to be able to work with some of my favorite actors like Ryan Reynolds and Ken Watanabe. Justice Smith is incredible. And uh, it's just a fun movie. And I think a lot of people have had a chance to go back and discover it uh, during the pandemic, which has been really rewarding for me. Um, so yes, I, I'm just really proud of it. And, and I think it was kind of the thing that transitioned me into sort of the fantasy science fiction space that I really 
have always wanted to be playing in. And, and thanks to this movie that that's allowed a lot of things to start to happen in, in my life. So uh, yeah, it's just a fun movie to watch for everybody. And, and I'm very proud of it. So Dan, so just uh, while we don't have the image here, just queue up. You've got some new stuff coming come into the screen tell 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 us what yes you so in in probably sometime this summer i have a show coming to uh the disney channel that is about a latina superhero called ultraviolet and that will be on the disney channel i think sometime this summer i created that show uh, it's called ultraviolet and black scorpion now um and it's a, basically about uh, a young latina girl in los angeles who inherits a lucha libre mask that has magical powers and it turns out her uncle has been fighting crime in disguise of the Black Scorpion, a Lucha Libre superhero. So that'll be on the Disney Channel. And then in probably in the fall or late fall, uh, maybe around, not 100%, but late fall, early winter, uh, I have an adult animated comedy coming to Hulu called uh, mm -hmm. Koala Man, which I am show running along with the creator of the show, uh, Michael Cusack, who also recently had the show Smiling Friends, if anyone saw that on Adult Swim, it's really funny. And um, I, I've been show running that and we're in post-production on that now. We have an absolutely incredible cast that I'm not allowed to talk about, but will be, you know. Oh, what's that about? Oh, what if a- anyone watch, If anyone what watches, a follow my Twitter for, <laughs> they will kill me. They will kill me if I, <laughs> if I, if I spoil it. But I, I all I can say is that, uh, there are some very famous people in the show and it's pretty amazing. <laughs> so that's a little teaser. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty hardcore. It is definitely for adults, uh, but it's, it's got a good heart. It's not a cynical show at all. And I'm, I'm really excited for people to see what we've been working on. All right. Well, uh, with a tease like that, now I'm going to hold, you got to promise that you're going to come back on the show when you can talk about it. I promise I will come back on the show when I can talk about it. All right, I'm ho I'm holding you to that. It's a, ver it's a verbal contract with witnesses. It is. Uh, it, that is that is impending, and both of those things should be out uh, before the end of the year, which is pretty exciting to have two things kind of on deck. All right, that's great. All right, so I think we lost Peter. So and we don't have an image for him anyway. He didn't send me one. So. That's our show, folks. Um, I want to thank Bob and Aaron and Glenn, Peter, Mike, and Dan for stopping by and for everyone who's watching at home. If you haven't already, order your copy of The Phenomenons Volume 1 and jump on the Kickstarter for Volume 2, which will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'm your host, Russ Colchamiro, and I'll see you all next week. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. Take care Bye, now. Everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, nice to see everybody. All right. Take care. It was great to see everyone. Thanks, Bye, Bye.